Hello and welcome. Today we're going to spend um, a bit of time, a little over half an hour, learning about trilobites and the group to which the trilobites belong, the arthropods. So without further ado, I'm going to move swiftly on so we can cover this in as little time as possible. And today we're going to start by talking about the um, biology of this group after I have introduced them to you. So the obvious question here is what is a trilobite? So trilobites are animals. Um, they're in fact a member of a group of bilaterally symmetrical animals. If you look at the trilobites I've put on this slide here and draw a line down the middle, the left and the right hand side are symmetrical. So they're bilaterally symmetrical animals. Um, they have segments. Each one of these divisions in the, um, the middle of the creature is a segment, for example. They have an exoskeleton. Um, this is an external support structure um, that provided protection during life. And they have a body that is split longitudinally, so looking uh, down the creature into three lobes. This middle one here, that's the axial lobe, and then ones on either side of that, which are called the pleural lobes. The examples on this slide show a little bit of the variation in the morphology of this group. Many of them look like the two on the left here. However, in different parts of the Paleozoic, some trilobites develop really, really interesting spined morphologies and all kinds of crazy ornamentation, which is really cool. So there you go. They are a unique and very successful group of animals and they were common um, with caveats throughout the Paleozoic era. In fact, in the Paleozoic, they make up a large proportion of species diversity, at least as we can tell from the fossil records. So they were really, really successful. An obvious question, and one I'm going to introduce for all of the animals that I'm going to introduce over the course of these um, lectures and videos, is where these organisms sit on the tree of life. Before I start with this, I wanted to highlight uh, and remind you that taxonomy and phylogeny are different things. So on the left here, we've got the taxonomy of the trilobites, and the taxonomy is how they fit into the hierarchical um, classification that was first invented by Linnaeus of living organisms. This was covered um, by Rob in your first year courses. The uh, phylogeny, such as that that's shown on the right here, looks at how organisms are related to each other. Taxonomy often does, in some respects, reflect phylogeny, but the two don't overlap entirely. So just be aware that they are slightly different things. If you have questions about that, um, and there's lots we can talk about in terms of taxonomy and phylogeny, uh, the time to ask about it um, is in the Zoom sessions associated with these videos. So if you are interested in learning more, please do note it down to ask me about this later um, in those Zoom sessions. Now the trilobites are actually members of a larger group called the arthropods, as we've already mentioned. So in terms of taxonomy, they are animals. This means that the members of the domain Eukarya, that's a domain that includes fungi and plants, as well as animals and a load of single-celled organisms. Um, trilobites are a member, member of the phylum arthropoda. Um, we'll learn about those in the next few slides. And the trilobites themselves are a class. So they are this level of the Linnaean taxonomy, and they comprise nine orders, 180 families, 5,000 genera, and 25,000 species. To put that in a tiny bit of context for you, there are roughly 5,900 species of mammals. So the trilobites were really quite a successful group for a very, very long time. Um, because they're arthropods, they sit here on the Tree of Life. You can see this um, purple square around the arthropods. They are most closely related in terms of the organisms on this tree to a group called the Onocophora, the velvet worms. These are really cool creatures. I can highly recommend you look them up. And their arthropods and onocophorans are closely related to a group called the tardigrades or water bears. Also really cool creatures worth looking up. The only organism to be able to survive, as far as we're aware, the uh, vacuum of outer space. Pretty neat. Um, so these and a load of um, worm uh, species, uh, groups, I should say, they're not multiple species of worms, many species of worms, make up a clade called the ecdysozoa. These are animals that grow by ecdysis, so they molt their exoskeleton as they grow. Um, 
so if you remember from Rob's lectures last year, a clade is a group of animals that are more, or organisms I should say, that are more closely related to each other than they are to everything else. The ecdysozoans are part of a broader clade called the protostomes. This is defined by what the first hole in the embryo becomes. An embryo starts off as a ball of cells, flattens, then creates a, um, a hollow ball of cells with a hole in the bottom. If that hole becomes a mouth, you're a protostome. If that hole becomes the anus, you're a deuterostome. And that's the major division in the animal tree of life. So I'm going to spend the next couple of slides just quickly introducing this group, the arthropods, because they are actually really, really important. So arthropods, including the trilobites, are animals that are united by having an exoskeleton and a segmented body, but also by having paired jointed appendages. The appendages, or the derivatives of the appendages, are often used for respiration as well as locomotion, so walking and feeding. In marine taxa, that's often through having multiple branches, one of which is a walking leg and one of which is a gill. And then um, the respiratory structures in land, arthropods become highly kind of specialized and derived, but they're still limb derivatives. Their bodies, the bodies of arthropods, are often differentiated into different zones or regions called tegma. We'll come up against that word, I'm afraid, in the next video. Um, and often in the arthropod groups, there are three of these. Uh, in some of the groups, this is called the head, the abdomen, and the thorax, although this is not universally true. Different groups have different names and different um, sets of body regions. Uh, the arthropods comprise four living groups, namely the uh, chelicerates. That's the arachnids and their kin, as represented by the scorpion on the left-hand side here. The crustaceans. That's um, crabs, lobster, shrimp, wood lice, interestingly. And quite a, a wide range of different um, organisms, many of which are marine. There are the myriapods. That's millipedes and centipedes and a couple of smaller groups. And there are the insects shown on the right here. This is um, a group of arthropods that's really successful um, that generally has three sets of, of walking limbs. So those are the arthropods. Why am I telling you all of this? Why is this worth your time and attention? Well, I really do think you should care about this. Arthropods are incredibly important. So to a first approximation, everything that is living is a uh, beetle. Arthropods um, are really, really important because they make up, by all estimates, more than 50% of described species. By many estimates, somewhere between 85 and 95% of all described species are arthropods. Now, obviously, that's not the be-all and end-all of importance. Um, we, we have trouble describing bacteria into species, and they're very, very important. Plants, the basis of all our food chains, so also important. But nevertheless, we're looking at a hyper-diverse and really successful group. Because as well as there being lots of species, these are super-duper abundant. There's loads of them. They're a great example of, for example, ecosystem services. Um, insects pollinate the majority of our crops, which we eat, and therefore they um, contribute to human economies to the order of hundreds of billions of pounds per year. So this is a natural service that they provide to us. And as such, we have to care about the insects and the arthropods more generally. If you want some more facts and figures, I can happily give them to you in the Zoom uh, session associated with this lecture, because I think it's really, really important to cover all of this. Arthropods are related, as shown in this tree. That group, the uh, chelicerates, or arachnids and their kin, probably split earliest from uh, the lineage of the rest of the arthropods. And then the trilobites, the group we're going to spend the rest of the day looking at, are the sister group to another clade here. That's a clade called the mandibulata. They're, un they're united, defined by having mandibles for eating, and comprises the myriapods, as I've mentioned, and the crustaceans and the insects. Interestingly, I'll mention it quickly here, insects are actually just highly derived crustaceans. Crustaceans aren't a true grouping because the insects um, were born within the crustacean group. So that's pretty cool. And while all of the other groups do have a rich fossil record, trilobites are the focus of today's lecture because they're really important in Cambrian to Permian rocks. They're, the, as I'm sure you will notice, the only member of this important clade to have gone extinct. Um, and I think it's really, really worth us spending a little bit of time both looking at 
what they are, how they live their lives, and also um, why they're useful to us as geologists. So without further ado, let's look at the trilobites. First things we have to look, consider is when these organisms were around, and that is shown in this graph here. So this shows the number of genera we have recovered per stage within each one of these geological time periods. Bear in mind that this graph is um, could be a reflection of the abundance and the success of the group, but it could equally be a um, reflection of the number of rocks we have from each one of these stages and how much time people spend looking for fossils within these rocks. So bear in mind there are some biases there. This doesn't necessarily show the diversity or successfulness of the group, but it definitely does um, show the probability of us as geologists actually finding one of these things when we're out doing field work. And that's why I'm including it here. Underneath this, I've simplified that in all of the, um, the graphs that I'm going to be showing you, and I'll, I'll show you one of these graphs for every single group that we're going to talk about, um, about showing when these were successful or important or common as fossils, shade in grey, and then other time periods, shade in white, when they were often limping along. So the trilobites were, as you can see, both diverse and successful, with the caveats that I've just given to you, in the early periods of the Paleozoic. During the Devonian, the majority of orders went extinct, and then the group underwent a long and slow decline before finally dying off at the end of the Permian, and a massive extinction that happened between the Permian and the Triassic. When they were around, they formed an important part of the mobile, so that means the moving benthos. So benthos are organisms that live on the seafloor. So while some were pelagic, as we'll learn in a minute, that means they were swimming, um, they were uh, often benthic creatures scrabbling around on ancient seafloors. So that brings me on nicely to the next slide, which is looking at some of the biology of these creatures. And I wanted to just highlight two things for you to finish off this video. First, I wanted to talk about the, um, the mode of life of these creatures. How do they live their lives? The first thing to point out is that they are all marine and they lived in water. So that means that the fact they were marine means they lived in salty water rather than fresh water. There is a limited amount of evidence from trace fossils that they could temporarily move over land between, for example, bodies of water, but we don't think this was particularly common. As they evolved over geological time, the trilobites are actually really interesting from an evolutionary viewpoint because we see different morphologies associated with mode of life um, evolving independently within different lineages. So throughout the Paleozoic, these different lineages show extensive what we would call convergent evolution. The same kind of body type, a thing called an ecomorph, appears repeatedly in different lines of the trilobites reflecting convergent evolution of the same life strategies within these different groups. As an example, you can see on this slide, shown in red on the left hand side here, some swimmers. These are trilobites that have very large eyes and reduced pleurae, these things on the side here. Uh, they appear suited to life in the water column, possibly surface waters. Those uh, organisms shown, the trilobites shown in orange here, um, were smooth. And they were probably associated with uh, a carbonate environment, such as a reef. And the body in the pygidium, uh, that's the, uh, the, the kind of the thorax in this in the middle, and then this, this end bit is called the pygidium, as we'll learn in a minute, was buried within the sediment, with the head, shown at the front here, resting on the surface. The taxa shown in blue here um, have reduced eyes and probably inhabited deeper water habitats. Uh, there's, a, there's a trend in many uh, trilobite groups towards losing their eyes. Finally, those species shown in green here had a thin exoskeleton, and this means they could be associated with life in um, environments with low oxygen levels, where you don't have the ability to invest a lot of energy in building up a tough exoskeleton. You want something kind of light and quite efficient. So these are really cool examples of how finding trilobites within a sediment can sometimes tell you about the nature of the deposition of that sediment. We'll get onto that in video number three in just a minute, but also it's a really cool example of morphological convergence, um, which has an adaptive significance. And I wanted to finish this video 
by telling you about the growth or what is called the ontogeny of these animals. I've put a definition of ontogeny on the slide for you. This is the developmental course of an organism from egg through to maturity. As with other arthropods, trilobites grow by egg dysis. So they, um, uh, they molt their exoskeleton as they grow. Um, to, for the, because they have to molt to become an adult, um, they've got to discard a large number of exoskeletons, things called exuviae, as they grow. Hence, we often find just bits of a trilobite, and the number of trilobite fossils that we have may well not represent the number of individuals that were actually there in any given um, deposit, because many of these could be molts. So, for example, we may want to take the number of fossils that we have in a deposit and divide it by, say, five, to, to try and get a, an idea of how many actual individuals there may have been in that environment. The earliest molting stages um, don't look much like adults at all. There is a larval stage within the trilobites called the protaspid. You can see it on the left here. Um, this is uh, not articulated. It doesn't have segments allowing it to bend. And it may have been swimming freely in the water column, so it may have been planktonic in many groups. It's pretty much just a small disc. All trilobites have a posterior region to the body. I've already mentioned it, and we're gonna learn more about it in the next um, video, but this is called the pygidium. Um, you can see an example of this thing here. And in the next life stage, the uh, miraspis, the miraspid stage, the um, pygidium had thoracic segments, these segments in the middle, forming at its anterior margin. So you can see at the front here, you would form new segments. And these are then released as the trilobite molts, I mean successive molts, building up the thorax. So this is how these creatures grow. It's a really interesting, um, A, that we know that, and B, that's a really interesting way to grow your body stage by stage. That's a bit different if you think about it to how, say, mammals like us grow, or our bones get longer, we don't add bits, typically. Um, the final stage, called the holaspis stage, has a full complement of thoracic segments for the species. So at that point, Animals, these animals still grew via molting until they reached maturity. Each time they'd molt, their body would get bigger. They wouldn't add segments to their body. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for sticking with me. And in the next video, we're going to be looking at the morphology of the trilobites. So onwards and upwards.